evening, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here, especially with Alan and Mike sharing the panel with me. And it reminds me of a lot of times over the last three or four years when three of us and a couple of others, Barry Bluestone, were together around the table trying to figure out what was going to happen to revenues and what that meant for the budgets that Governor Patrick and uh, those of us on his team had to put together. And I, I was kind of missing you guys until I heard all that gloom and doom. Sometimes it wasn't that uplifting, but it was always really informative. So what advice would I give the governor on budget and finance? I hope you will forgive me if I change up the question a little bit. Because um, my advice isn't aimed at Governor Patrick. He already gets this. He spent time with Alan Clayton Matthews and others on his uh, Council of Economic Advisors looking at these numbers for four straight years. He spent time with leaders like Mike Widmer understanding these facts. So I think it's some of the other candidates and some of the voters that need a clinic on these facts. And I hope you will help spread the word about this, the same way Mike does with the leadership that he provides in talking about these very tough issues. Governor Patrick led the Commonwealth of Massachusetts through four increasingly difficult budgets with compassion as well as attention to fiscal responsibility amidst the worst recession in generations. And Mike and Alan have both laid out the framework for you to understand exactly the dimension of this, uh, this perfect storm of financial facts. So I was there for the first three of the governor's budgets and I saw firsthand how he personally worked to solve these budgets in very tough times. Again, with compassion, but also attention to fiscal discipline. And I've got a bunch of the folks um, from his finance team uh, who were with us for, for some of those budgets here and it's great to see them. I saw how much the governor cared about these issues as well as how hard he worked them. Between the fiscal 09 and 11 budgets, for all the reasons that you've just seen and heard, the governor had to come up with a total of $13 billion in budget solutions across those four budgets. And, and Alan gave a really good picture about that underlying structural deficit. I will tell you that we inherited um, a, a structural deficit of more than a billion dollars when we came into office back in fiscal 07. Um, and so it was not as though the budget was balanced when the governor came into office, even, even when there was still uh, a time of expansion. And you've heard that this gap arose from plunging state revenues, and also, you have to point out, from greater use of the state services that are provided to vulnerable citizens during times like this. So every program that's there for health care or transitional assistance or job supports, more, you know, uh, health care for uh, people who've lost their jobs, all of those programs have much more enrollment in them now, and you can understand why. The governor made these cuts with a combination of cuts in savings, use of federal stimulus, as Mike's just told you, judicious use of the rainy day fund, and some modest new revenues. Under Governor Patrick and his budgets, state spending grew by an average of just under 1.7%. So if you took the growth in spending across his four budgets and averaged them across those years, Growth of spending is 1.7% on average. That compares with 4.7% on average over the last 15 or so years. And 6.6% in Governor Romney's budgets. Let me say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Romney's budgets grew by an average of 6.6% per year. Governor Patrick's budgets grew by under 1.7%. By the way, when Charlie Baker was AMF secretary, but it's below 5%. Governor Patrick prioritized health care and other services for the state's most vulnerable citizens, preserving Chapter 78 for cities and towns, schools, which is now at a record high level despite these fiscal challenges, and investments in green jobs and life sciences to help to grow the economy in those sectors where Massachusetts does particularly well. Again, largely because of the, um, the prevalence of the great universities here. And some of the job growth that you saw in Allen's charts, no doubt, stems from some of those initiatives. I'll tell you that this is not only about what the governor did, it's how he did it. Um, those of us who had the privilege of working closely with him saw him set priorities in the budget line by line, working late into the night by himself and come back with a document with his handwriting in it, sometimes making a decision to move $10,000. On the scale of a $30 billion budget, there wasn't a lot to play with. He was moving $10,000 from one line item to another, personally,
trying to minimize the, the impact on programs that he cared about that mean something to the citizens of the Commonwealth. Though it has had to be tapped during these tough times, as Mike just showed us, the Commonwealth Rainy Day Fund, also known as the Stabilization Fund, still has about $600 million in it. That puts Massachusetts at or near the top among states for holding on to reserves during these times. So this is not by any means a Massachusetts phenomenon alone. We stayed in touch with our counterparts in other states, and they are seeing the same revenue declines, and the same use of federal stimulus and rainy day funds that we did. And actually, Massachusetts is better positioned than many of those states. This discipline involved some tough choices. Executive branch employees are in their third year of no salary increases, while furloughs have actually reduced their effective pay. Collective bargaining increases for the union employees in the Commonwealth have been the lowest ever negotiated. After a one year <coughs> extension, when we first, the governor first took office of, of the 3% that had been negotiated by the Romney administration um, in their last year, Governor Patrick negotiated a four year contract with state union employees um, this is a whole set of contracts, but they all followed the pattern of zero, zero, one, three. That averages out to 1% a year, and that is unheard of in recent history. So when I hear people talk as though Governor Patrick has given away the store, I don't know where that's coming from. Because I've just told you about his spending increases and his um, contracts with union employees, and those are both things that he cares about. Um, of the candidates, he's the most supportive of state spending to help poor people. He's, in many ways, the most supportive of collective bargaining and, and unionized workforces, and yet those are the results that he had to come up with to do his duty to balance the budget in these tough times. And yet, progress didn't stop. As Mike said, really important to use a fiscal crisis to get some important reforms through, and under Governor Patrick, some of the fights he took on and won in his first term have been judicious use of the ability to use flagmen at construction sites, ethics and lobbying reform, pension reform, transportation reform, education reform, consolidation of the state's information technology, and more. And I'm not sure why it feels as though the governor, this governor gets less credit for doing those things than some other governors that they're talking about them and not getting it done. And I just ask you why that's the case. The governor's careful stewardship of the budget and financial condition has led the Wall Street rating agencies to confirm Massachusetts double A bond rating again and again, despite all the challenges that you've heard about. So my guidance is named to Governor Patrick. Like I said, he gets it already. My advice is for the politicians with simplistic answers and the voters who are tempted to believe them. I admit that I am cursing the TV these days in election season when I hear elect, well, wannabe elected officials, one after the other, get up and have those glib TV ads in which they promise to reduce the budget and take and reduce taxes at the uh, reduce taxes and the budget and still deliver the same quality of services. Like I don't get how that's possible because for three years I tried to. Um, give the governor the best advice about how to balance the budget, and we had to come up with a lot of really tough solutions, some involving revenue increases and some involving cuts. And, you know, having these seemingly capable, no-nonsense people get up, and, you know, some of them seem like they're otherwise smart people, and just try to sell us this bill of goods, it just makes me very depressed to believe that, to, or to, to just contemplate that voters are looking at those ads and believing that message. And bring on the rollback of the sales tax. Let's just, you know, tie another hand behind our back, right? Why didn't we think of that? This is so easy. <coughs> so some things learned the hard way about the budget, and Mike's already talked about some of them, but some of the, the realities that we confronted when we were trying to cut the budget to, to trim spending down, as I've described, the governor had to do. More than half the budget, as Mike said, is in health and human services. Of really about $28 billion in spending in the, from the general fund, over $10 billion of that is spent on mass health alone. During the recession, enrollments in the programs have grown, grown by 5% and spending by 9%. And you know medical inflation is one of the toughest economic challenges for really any sector of the economy, whether it's your home, your business, your state, your university, what have you. Other human services programs are, um, which also are being drawn on more to help people these, 
days are another, uh, when you add those in, we're up to 14.5 billion or more than half the $28 billion budget. <coughs> now many of these programs are not directly delivered by the state, they're delivered by payments to local charitable organizations that then deliver the services. And you take those, those payments to those groups away, not only are you cutting the service to the, the vulnerable citizens of the Commonwealth, but you're hurting those local organizations that in some cases are a vibrant part of their communities and employ people there too. So there can be a ripple effect from the state pulling back on those payments. As Mike said, Chapter 70 and other local aid represents <coughs> typically over 25% of the budget. And when the state cuts aid, you know what happens in cities and towns. There are defect, direct effects on local teachers, firefighters, police, and local budgets. Stimulus has been really important for the Commonwealth, but it's got a couple of downsides. One is, as Mike said, that there's a cliff at the end of that, and it's gonna create another budget gap um, when we have to fill that. And furthermore, you. Additional use of stimulus has come with additional requirements to maintain spending. So it's, the federal government gives you more money, and it's great, but they say, all right, this means you can't cut the Mass Health program. It's sort of a, a compact with the federal government in exchange for those, those dollars is that we have to lock in spending called maintenance of effort in some very, um, very restrictive ways. And similarly, a little known fact about the state budget that also makes it hard to cut and ties your hands in a lot of ways is the increasing tendency of different stakeholder groups, no doubt um, encouraged by lawyers, to sue the state, to compel the state to continue to provide high level of services for certain classes of people, typically um, folks with uh, disabilities of some type, perhaps physical, perhaps mental. There have been a number of court judgments like that. And Chapter 70 itself, education reform, has one of those embedded. That makes it impossible for the state to cut in those areas. So the more you freeze through lawsuits, through federal means of effort requirements, the fewer choices you have to cut on the other side. So looking ahead, you know, perhaps modest revenue growth on the horizon, but a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges ahead for um, Governor Patrick in his second term, which I think he's richly earned. Um, and, and I guess the, the last point I would make is, you know, it's not just about having a head to do this, it's about having a heart in order to make these cuts with a sense of compassion and a sense of what it means to cut dollars out of the state budget. It's not just, you know, cutting some state worker. In fact, you have to cut every single state employee to make up $5 billion gap. Yeah. And then how would the services be delivered? Um, there, are, there are only so many ways that you can cover $5 billion and, and most of them involve complete decimation of the services um, that people definitely count on in the Commonwealth for a quality of life, particularly in times like this. So um, what I would just like to share is that I, I watch this being done um, the hard way but the compassionate way. And uh, I believe that um, the right man for the governor's job is already in that seat. Um, and uh, I hope you'll forgive me being a little bit partisan, but now that I'm outside of the state government, I guess I can do that. <laughs> Thank you very much.